Well, good morning. Most of our lessons this year on Sunday morning, not all, have come from our daily Bible reading program. And we have done several from the Old Testament, and we'll be shifting back to the New Testament in, in the upcoming weeks. Uh, but we are over in the book of Numbers today. And your daily Bible reading is from Numbers chapter 8 and chapter 9. And so we've spent a lot of time talking about the tabernacle, talking about the priesthood, talking about the sacrifices, talking about the feast, talking about all those things that God mandated to the people as they approached him. And as we pointed out last week when we were working through Leviticus, only a people that have been made holy can approach a holy God. Well, today we are in Numbers. And there's more detail about the tabernacle. Uh, but at the very bottom of chapter 9 of Numbers, there's something that we really haven't talked about in any detail. The pillar, the cloud, and the fire, that was the indication to God's people that it was time to stop or it was time to go. So we want to spend some time this morning talking about that pillar of fire and that pillar of cloud that guided God's people. It was pointed out to you just a moment ago in our singing that yes, the song before the lesson and the song after the lesson both have to do with following the Lord. Where he leads, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow him. Now, you just sang that first hymn. And at the end of this lesson, you're going to sing the second. Did you understand the words that you were just singing? Did you really give thought, and maybe you did, to what it means to follow the Lord in all circumstances of your life. To allow him to be the guide of your life. To be the one that sets the pace of your life. To be the one that sets the direction of your life. You sang words proclaiming that that's what you want to do in service to the Most Holy God. So we're going to walk through and make some observations about this text. And the first one deals specifically with the cloud and the fire and how they signified the presence of God. Verses 15 and 16 of Numbers 9. Now, on the day that the tabernacle was raised up, cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. From evening until morning, it was above the tabernacle like the appearance of fire. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. I don't know about you, but I know for me, there are times in life I would just love to be able to see a sign. A sign that says, David, this is God, I'm here. Because as we walk through this period that we call life, sometimes we wonder, is God really there? Does God really know what's going on in my life? Does God really care to be in that camp of Israel. And every morning when you walk out of the tent, there's that cloud. 
signifying God is right here. And every night when you went to bed, you could see that fire illuminating the sky. And you knew as you laid your head down to sleep that the Lord was there. Those were people that walked, that traveled, that journeyed by sight. That's not how you and I journey. Paul would say to the Corinthians, we walk by faith, not by sight. But to be able to see that God is right here. And that whatever my day, whatever my week, whatever my life might hold, I am never separated from God and his guidance and his provision. He's always with me. It's been a rough, rough few weeks in this congregation. We're still dealing with COVID. We're, we've had two funerals in this congregation this week. It's been challenging. So where are you, Lord? Let me pose a question to you that's a little different. How did you get through this week? How did you mentally, emotionally, physically survive the challenges that this week brought? I think the first time I ever really dealt with that question was in the death of my daughter. And it wasn't while I'm walking that journey of, of physical recovery and, and having buried a child and moving on. It was when people came up to us a year later, two years later. How did y'all get through that? How did you deal with that loss? I don't know that I could ever give them a detailed answer. The only answer I could give, God saw us through. Now, what God was doing on a daily basis, what doors were, were he opening, what people did he put in my path on a day when I was really struggling? Kind of think Philip and the eunuch there for a moment. It was not just a coincidence that their paths crossed that day. What all was God doing that I didn't see? Where God was giving me what I needed for the moment and what I needed for the day. And you know what? God still does that. How do you deal with going to a doctor? How do you deal with a bad medical report? How do you deal with a hospitalization? How do you deal with COVID? How do you deal with all this other stuff? If you're wanting me to give you a, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and all's going to be okay, I am not that wise. And I don't know of anybody that is. But then there's God. And I look back at this past week. What a week. And it was God. How did I get from two Sundays ago to last Sunday? How did I get from last Sunday to this Sunday? There was God. That's the evidence. How do I know he's there? I survived. How do you know he's there? You survived. You're not going to step out of this building and see that cloud. You're not going to step out of this building and see that pillar of fire. But God is present in your life. We all know the poem about the footprints. The individual looking back at their life and there were places where, yes, he was walking with the Lord and there were two sets of footprints. 
And, and then there were other times there was only one set, and they asked the Lord, where were you in those moments? And you know the answer, don't you? In that poem, the Lord replies, that's when I was carrying you. The Lord is here. The Lord is with his people. And while we may not see that physical sign, it doesn't mean he isn't here. Speaking of signs, did you notice the one a couple weeks back? It's put up on our sign out front. I really like that one. If you're looking for a sign from God, this might be it. I, I, I really like that one. Our next point, and we're going to step away from numbers for just a moment, and we're going to go back to the book of Exodus. Matter of fact, the first mention of that pillar of cloud and pillar of fire goes back to Exodus 13 and Exodus 14. And there's something there that I think you and I need to understand. It's implied in what we're reading in Numbers 9, but it's just overtly stated back in Exodus. Exodus 13, verse 20, 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. So think in terms of light. Exodus 14, verse 20. This is, they've left Egypt. We're at that Red Sea moment. There comes the Egyptian army. There's the water. What are we going to do? So it the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. That presence of God that we were just talking about, what does the presence of God do, do? It gives us light. And it gives us protection. You and I are in the mighty hand of God. That doesn't mean struggle isn't going to come. And that doesn't mean death isn't going to come. But it does mean that whatever comes, I and you are in the palm of Almighty God's hand. And in the darkest moments of life, God's light is there. In the darkest moments of our existence, God is there. And he's lighting the way for us through his word through the people he puts in our life, through the spirit living in us. He lights the way for us. There is a path to follow. But there is protection. All the Egyptian army had to do was pass on through and they could have wiped out the people of Israel. And on this side, God's parting the water. God's providing a way. And they begin that journey of crossing over to the other side to safety. And that goes on all through the night. And God is lighting the way. He's cleared the path. They see the path. But here behind them, all the Egyptian army can see is darkness. All the Egyptian army can do is sit there and wait. You and I have been given God's promise. His promise 
that if we will stand with him, there is not anything that this life or that hell itself can do to us to defeat us. Nothing. And the world sometimes may truly be in the depths of darkness. But that's not where you and I are. As Paul would say in 1 Thessalonians 5, we are children of light. We do not live in the darkness. As John would say in 1 John chapter 1, we walk in the light, not in the darkness. Because God is light. And if you're with him, even if you don't know how you're going to get there, you know where you're going. And you know that God is going to be with you every step of the way. Thirdly, maybe thirdly. Oh, there we go. Thirdly, these verses that we're looking at today, verses 15 through 23 of Numbers 9, Seven times, seven times in that brief passage, there is the word command or commandment that's used. That doesn't even include, depending on your translation, that the word charge, a charge from God has been given, and that's used, I believe, at least twice. How can you pack so much into a brief passage about the command of the Lord? I said a moment ago, if we'll just stay by his side, that there isn't anything that life or death or that hell itself can do to stop us, to defeat us, The only thing that can remove us from that light is our choice. We choose whether to obey the commands, the commandments, the charges that God has given to us. Where God has said, do this, obey me. Obey me. You know I'm there. Trust in me that I'm there. Obey me because I am there. I'm just going to read to you verse 23. This same thought is expressed in verse 18. This same thought is expressed in verse 20. But this is just verse 23 that I'm about to read to you. And again, notice how many times command, commandment, or charge is used. One verse. At the command of the Lord, they remain encamped. And at the command of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Do you think there might be a point to that word being used so many times, that concept being expressed so many times just in that one verse? God says, follow me. I'm not going to let you down. Follow me. And that means obey me. Do what I say. You want the good life? has nothing to do with your bank account. You want the good life? It has nothing to do with your car or your house or your boat or whatever else you have. You want the good life? Follow the Lord. Keep his commandments because life doesn't get better than that. You want joy, you want peace, you want contentment, you, you want that sense that I can persevere. 
You're not going to find that in what the world calls success. You're going to find that by walking in the path that God has illuminated. You're going to find that by walking in the light. You're going to find that in keeping those commandments. You're going to find that by following His lead. That means I got to be in His Word. Where does God tell me what He wants me to do? Through His Word. Now I realize every week as we've gone through this kind of working through our daily Bible reading, I've said something about reading Scripture. As I pointed out to you last week when we were looking at Leviticus, I doubt there's anybody in this room that says now that Leviticus is my all-time favorite book. I enjoyed it so very much. Because if you're saying that, the front pew is open for all those that need to respond. Leviticus was a challenge. And just wait till you get to the beginning of 1 Chronicles. Oh, my. Ten chapters of all these names. I, I usually, when I come to that part, I play the audio. Because if it's got more than two syllables, I struggle. If it's got three, I'm going to leave one of those syllables out. And if it's got five or six, I just kind of look at it. Why couldn't they name you Fred? Okay? But there is something about being in that Word. And it's not easy. Oh, there are passages that we love to read, that we enjoy reading. We, we go back to them over and over and over because they're our favorites. And they give us that, that pep, that encouragement. But if I want to know what the command of the Lord is, I need to read the whole thing. I, I need to get in there and plow through the easy parts. And I need to get in there and plow through the hard parts. Because you know what? If God said it, it's important. If God included it in his word, it's important. And if I want to follow my Lord, if I want to keep those commandments, if I want to follow my Lord in keeping the will of the Almighty, then I got to spend time knowing what the Almighty expects. Our final point this morning. And to me, this was a big one. Sometimes when preachers are preaching and they come to kind of like their final point, uh, it, it's more of a, a summary. There's one more slide after this that's the summary. But this point I'm about to make you is to you is substantial. We have all faced life decisions. My family and I spent 30 plus years in Middle Tennessee. The only time I had ever been to Florida was on vacation. We had been at the previous congregation for 15 years. And as I've told you before, could have stayed there and retired there and been happy. They liked us. We liked them. Life was good. Or we could make a move. My youngest daughter was going to have to change schools. My wife was taking an early retirement. My mother-in-law, who was still working at that point, she and Kathy retired on the same day. This window, this door was open. Do we go 
or do we stay? It took some prayer. It took a lot of checking out you people. A lot. Yeah, I didn't check very well, did I? <laughs> Actually, a lot more than you might know. <laughs> it took some calls. It took some interviewing. It took a trip down here to meet you face to face. And we made the decision to move to Florida to pace. To be with you and you with us. That was a good decision. That, that was a good decision. Not every decision is as easy to make as coming here. Not every decision is, oh, well, here's this, here this. Let me, let me weigh the options. But if you got to decide between going and staying, if you'll pray to God about it and spend some time in his word, you'll make a wise choice. At the end of this section on Numbers 9, you have this thought in verse 17. It's in verse 19. I'm going to read to you verses 21 and 22. Very similar language. So it was. When the cloud remained only from evening until morning, when the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they would journey, whether by day or by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up, they would journey. Whether it was two days, a month, or a year that the cloud remained above the tabernacle, the children of God would remain in camp and not journey. But when it was taken up, they would journey. Can I put that in nice, simple English? Okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? What is your will? There's a cloud. Doesn't look like we're moving right now. There's that pillar of fire. Nope. Looks like we're going to be here overnight. And then it would move. And the people started packing. I said a moment ago that if you've got tough decisions to make, and you're spending time in the Word of God, and you're spending time praying about that decision, that it will be for the glory of God, you will make a wise decision. Guarantee that. I guarantee that. Because it's not that you're looking for some visible sign from God, but to what source are you going to make that decision? Whose lead are you following? God's. God's. Because you know what? If you're in God's word and you're trying to understand God's will and you're looking for the sign, you're looking at the right place. And if there's an opportunity out here and it's not matching up with what God says in his instructions, then that rules out that option. If you're praying about it and praying, you're ready for this? God, I, not that, God, I really want this job. I really want to have this, whatever. Can you just open the door and let me have it and then I'll do all this for you. Do not try bargaining with God. Do not try making deals with God. God, if you'll do this, then I'll do that. No, no, no. But if you're praying to God, Father, these words are going to sound very familiar. Thy will be done 
Remember when Jesus prayed those words? In the garden? See, Jesus had a choice. He did not have to go to that cross because, quite honestly, we weren't worth it. But God so loved the world that he gave. Jesus willingly laid down his life for us. Not the easy path. Not the route of smooth sailing. If there's any way, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but thy will be done. And you and I have hope and peace and comfort because God's will was done. If you were praying to God, not that you will be glorified, but that God will be glorified. God will open the door. God will make a way. You're not going to see the cloud depart or the pillar of fire depart. But you will have the confidence in knowing that because you're putting God first in the choices you make, that he will lead the way. I said at the beginning that the opening song and the closing song to this lesson had to do with following Jesus. Where he leads, I'll follow, that we sang at the beginning, has this as its chorus. Where he leads, I'll follow. Follow all the way. Where he leads, I'll follow. Follow Jesus every day. The song that we're about to sing, where he leads me, I will follow. This is its chorus. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Are you following Jesus? Are you doing what the Lord says? Are you basing your decisions on his glory and his will? Are you trusting in him in the confidence that he is near and he gives light and he gives protection, that he gives peace and he gives comfort, whatever life may bring? Will you follow him into the water? Will you follow him into a watery grave so you can contact the blood of Jesus? And when you, will you follow him when you come up out of that water? Baptism is a beginning. It's not the end. It's a new birth. It's not the last mile of the way. Follow him into the water. And then follow him the rest of the journey. But sometimes as we're following the Lord, we get tired. And it doesn't go as smoothly as maybe we wanted. We get a little frustrated, maybe a lot frustrated. And maybe we grumble and complain, kind of like the Israelites did of old. Will you follow him? Will you follow the Lord?
Let's bow together, please. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. And Father, in life, in death, in the good times, in the challenging times, we pledge this day to follow our God. To follow you wherever you lead us. To follow you not just in verbally saying that we will, but that we truly will follow you in our thinking, in our speech, and in our action. Father, may your will be done. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen.